Hello everyone, and welcome back to a very delayed new episode of Jurassic Games. Sorry for having this out so late, but due to a mixture of schoolwork, my job, and family things, this episode had to be delayed for a while. But, it's finally here, and today's episode will be a fun one. Last time, we rounded off our coverage of the game's release for The Lost World. So, where do we go from there? Well, following the commercial success of The Lost World in theaters, it was pretty obvious to Universal that another follow-up would be warranted. And in 2001, we got that follow-up, which was very creatively titled, Jurassic Park 3. And how was it? Well, after a number of production problems leading up to its release, let's just say reception was mixed. And similarly, the movie was not the hit Universal had hoped it would be only garnering $368 million at the box office against its $93 million budget. Not a failure by any means, but a disappointment in both critical, audience, and box office reception. As with the previous two films, Jurassic Park 3 received its fair share of tie-in games. Can these games make up for the failings made by the film they're based on? Let's find out. In today's episode, we'll be covering the three games developed for PC by Knowledge Adventure, which some of you may recognize as the developer and publisher of the Jumpstart series. So, without any further delay, let's get into it. First on our list is the infamous game Jurassic Park 3 Dino Defender. And boy what an interesting one this is. Dino Defender released on June 29, 2001, so it actually came out before the movie it's based on. Normally this is where I tell you the game's plot, but rather than me do that, I think I'll let the game's very over-the-top narrator tell you instead. This is a Dino Defender alert. The situation is critical in Jurassic Park. A typhoon struck at 8.47 last night. Winds were clocked at over 135 miles per hour. The high winds knocked out our power system. We're running on reserves, but they won't hold out for long. Without those fences, the dinosaurs will run wild and out of our control. Dino Defenders, you must act now before the dinosaurs destroy one another. Gear up and scramble to the copter for your final mission briefing. Listen up, Dino Defenders. Here's the mission. Turn on the circuit breakers to bring power back to the island. As you move throughout the island, trap, tranquilize, and capture all carnivorous dinosaurs. This will require more equipment than you can carry. We'll airdrop supplies for you. Keep an eye out for them. You'll need to find all the supply boxes. Prepare to exit. This might be a little bumpy. I think it's needless to say that this game does not at all attempt to adhere to the plot of Jurassic Park 3. Something I've always found strange is the design of the player character, who for some reason looks like some Master Chief knockoff. The game is a side-scrolling platformer, sort of like the PS1 The Lost World game, except far uglier. The general gist is that you go across the island attempting to turn on all of the circuit breakers, while avoiding being killed by a variety of dinosaurs such as the Compies, Raptors, and the T-Rex. Of all of the platforming games we've covered so far, this definitely feels the weakest, and it can actually be strangely difficult at times as well. The game culminates in an escape from a T-Rex and Spinosaurus who begin to fight, followed by a final battle with the Spinosaurus inside of the game's visitor center. Soundtrack-wise, this is probably the weakest game we've covered thus far, and it has no music tracks that are really interesting or stand out. The game does have save slots though, so that alone gives it a big boost. Well, actually, every game from the Jurassic Park 3 era features save slots, so perhaps I can't give it too much credit. Perhaps the most memorable aspect of the game is its general weirdness, from the setting to the sort of strange-looking dinosaur renders. Ultimately, Dino Defender is a rather strange, yet mediocre Jurassic Park platforming game that has largely been left by the wayside. One thing I will recommend people do is watch the Games Done Quick 2020 speedrun of the game, because it's pretty funny. Otherwise, there's not much to recommend here beyond the weirdness of it all, 
and of course the Jurassic Park game collector's aspect here as well. Continuing on the train of weird games, next up is Jurassic Park 3 Danger Zone. Danger Zone released on the same day as Dino Defender in 2001, which I believe is the only time two Jurassic Park games have debuted at the exact same time. Before starting the game this time, you'll notice that there's actually a sort of character select menu. The characters are all humans whose names are essentially dinosaur punts. I, I just I don't think the world would be the same without Missy Link and Rick Raptor. Just like last time, the game's intro is provided by the same over-the-top narrator as Dino Defender. And in fact, the intro cutscene uses much of the same footage, just with different dialogue. This video was shot just minutes ago in Jurassic Park. The island was hit by a devastating earthquake. It's confirmed our stock of dinosaur DNA was completely destroyed. Without these building blocks of Jurassic life, the dinosaurs could become extinct all over again. Gear up and scramble to the copter for your final mission briefing. So, what kind of game is Danger Zone? A shooter? Another platformer? Nope, none of these things. Danger Zone is a... party board game? Yeah, that's right. Jurassic Park 3 Danger Zone is essentially a Mario Party clone with support for two players. The game has you go around a board completing various minigames so that you can collect dinosaur DNA. The minigames are varied, including dinosaur fighting minigames and driving segments. What's immediately noticeable is the fact that many of the assets are reused across this game and Dino Defender, including the dinosaur models and even the weird Master Chief looking human suit. Something I'll briefly touch upon with this game is its frequent referencing of Jurassic Park Institute. I won't go too in depth about the Jurassic Park Institute, but essentially it was what Universal planned to be a more educational aspect of the Jurassic Park franchise, largely centered around a JP Institute website. The website is long gone now, though parts of it can still be accessed via the Wayback Machine. The Jurassic Park Institute was not particularly long-lived, as Universal decided it wasn't worth the time, but their brief efforts to make it into a major part of the franchise live on in some of the games released during this era. Regardless, there isn't a whole lot else for me to talk about with Danger Zone if I'm honest. It's rather straightforward. One thing of note is that this game uses music that will also be found in the next game on our list. And speaking of which... Well, here's where I'd usually tell you about the final game we'll be discussing today but it actually won't be me this time. Because rather than have me tell you about it, I've invited my good friend Siaka to discuss the best game so far, Jurassic Park Dinosaur Battles. Alright, so getting this out of the way, Jurassic Park 3 Dinosaur Battles is the greatest thing ever created. Originally released in 2001 as Scan Command Jurassic Park, you're headed to Isla Sorna to save five campers. Their counselor somehow managed to mistake Site B for Cabo Blanco Nature Preserve, the location where the Bowman family was in the first Jurassic Park novel. Once there, you discover that InGen has been experimenting with dinosaur training. They use this device called the DinoVoc, which communicates with the dinosaurs, telling them what to do during combat. In like dinosaur language or something. It plays a recording of the dinosaur's vocalizations and the dinosaur responds. This is how gameplay is framed. Rather than control the dinosaur directly like you would in any other fighting game, what you do is you tell the AI what to do and if you're lucky it does it and it works. While rescuing the campers and fighting off wild dinosaurs, you find InGen's new can of worms, the Primos. InGen, for no particular reason, wants to replace the human race with superhuman clones. And to accomplish this, they're using the genetic material of the indigenous people who used to inhabit Isla Soria, a somewhat militant Mayan civilization called the Primos. Among their ancient ruins, you find cave paintings of dinosaurs that the Mayans venerated as protectors. The ancient protectors being Pteranodon, Tyrannosaurus and Spinosaurus, representing the air, land, and sea, respectively. Now, there's many implications that come along with the concept that the Mayans were aware of dinosaurs and happened to worship them on the exact same island which InGen would eventually come along to and start resurrecting dinosaurs. It raises a lot of questions, but rather than answer those, the game decides to raise even more questions. See, InGen's Dr. Quartz has already cloned three of the Primos. Two of them, she's given a Dinovoc to control dinosaurs and defend 
and her labs. One she left in a treehouse in a Dilophosaur infested swamp, presumably because he wasn't a very successful clone. Dr. Quartz here is a staunch social Darwinist. She believes that for the future of the human race, strong people, such as our superhuman clones, should be perpetuated, while weak people should be driven to extinction. She applies this logic to the dinosaurs. Through her, the game acknowledges its own experience system, with her personal notes explaining that the dinosaurs develop new skills as they beat up other dinosaurs. The weak, what good are they, she says. Once you defeat Dr. Quartz and her protector by sea, the Spinosaurus, your Dinovoc breaks, your dinosaurs turn on you, and the Primos vow to destroy InGen's equipment. You, having rescued the campers and completed your mission, leave. Whatever agency sent you there is presumably not much more ethical than InGen, since you leave the Primos and Dr. Quartz on its Lasorna to die. Dr. Quartz in particular being chased up a mountain by your own Spinosaurus. The game has some goliath-minded design choices. Ankylosaurus, a dinosaur you get halfway through the game, is impervious to most attacks. The thing is almost completely implacable. 9 out of 10 opponents you run into in the game can't even damage Ankylosaurus, since only moves with piercing in their names can lower its health. Ankylosaurus is also one of the faster dinosaurs in the game. In every regard, it's more pragmatic to just use Ankylosaurus throughout the rest of the game. And another thing is the weird dodging mechanic. You can teach your dinosaurs to dodge. However, they never actually obey when you tell them to dodge. Instead, they dodge randomly whenever they feel like it. You don't even have to teach them to dodge. They will dodge whether or not you ever taught them to dodge, sometimes even overriding your own commands. And probably the greatest sin this game ever commits, any game ever commits, is that you actually can't obtain Pteranodon. It's advertised that you can obtain Pteranodon. On the box, it warns that Pteranodon is particularly dangerous to your dinosaurs. But Pteranodon has no presence in gameplay in this game. It is story only. You steal one of InGen's Pteranodons after defeating the second Primo, after which you encounter a giant Pteranodon known as the Great Protector by Air. Your Pteranodon attacks this Pteranodon and then abandons you. All the game has to say about this is it flew out of range. Who cares about some giant bird? Frustrating to this day. Not so frustrating, for me at least, is the completely random selection of story elements this game decided to run with. I mean, if you really think about it, this game is a representation of chaos at its most raw. The idea that within seemingly random systems, there's an underlying consistency. I mean, there is an underlying consistency here. Half of this stuff already made it into the canon. You've got InGen doing illegal projects on Isla Sorna. Human cloning, of course. Dinosaurs being engineered and trained for military purposes. The concept of Mayan rule ruins on Isla Sorna ever gets canonized, I'm gonna buy 20 tickets to Dominion. Because this complete and utter nonsense, to me, is a testament to the beauty that is human creativity. That's all I gotta say, peace out. Big shout out to Siaka for being willing to spread the gospel of Jurassic Park Dinosaur Battles, I really appreciate it. And that's it for this episode's game coverage. The number of games was lower than usual this week, and that's simply because Jurassic Park 3 has some pretty varied games, and I want to make sure that I can get to all of them equally. And speaking of, the next episode will be on the Jurassic Park 3 games developed for the Game Boy Advance, of which there are four. That episode should hopefully be out before New Year's Eve as my way of apologizing for the delays of this episode. As always, your support is greatly appreciated, so if you haven't already, like the video and do consider subscribing as it really helps us out. I also recommend checking out the Godzilla Roundtable podcast here on the channel if you're a fan of Godzilla. With that said, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and if you're watching this the month it comes out, have a happy holiday season. Until next time. Take Dr. Court's boat and get everyone off the island. Yes. We will rip this place apart. Starting with the main computer. Destroy engine! We're free!